Bow with me as I pray. God, our Father, we thank You for sending Your Son, Jesus, into the world to rescue sinners. And as I sang the words of that song with my family in Christ at Grace Fellowship, I was just taken back a little to, to think that, Lord, even if we had nothing, if we had no one else, Christ is enough and He holds His people fast. Regardless of our circumstances, regardless of whether we are happy in those, He has to be enough. And He is enough. I pray now that as we come to this portion of the service where we offer our worship unto You, Lord, that You will help me Fill me with your spirit that I would preach in a manner that you are pleased with and that my brothers and sisters in Christ will hear and be able to rejoice in. Lord, I know that I won't cover every detail. I know that. But Lord, let us hear enough that our cup runneth over. I pray for the, for the lost sheep. Hear your voice. And they would hear your words. When you say that he who enters by me will be saved. God, may today be their day where they too can say Christ will hold me fast. Amen. For your glory I preach. Amen. Take your Bibles please and turn to John chapter 10. I was originally going to do verses 7 through 21, but instead we breaking that down to where this morning will be verses 7 through 13 and unless something changes next Sunday will be verses 14 to 21 the title last Sunday was the Good Shepherd Discourse I thought about doing part 3 today and coming back to part 2 but I'm just going to go in order today is the Good Shepherd Discourse part 2 and this is not to insult anyone's intelligence but even with information at our fingertips, I doubt that most of us fully grasp the shepherd sheep analogy that Jesus is using. And that's really more about being part of a culture where we don't have that. And we can read, we can watch videos, we might even take a trip to Israel. If you want to send me on a trip to Israel so I can learn more about this, I'm game. But regardless of how much or how little we understand, I am convinced that God is able and willing to teach us. One of the things he said in the hours before he would go to the cross was he said, it's actually better for you that I go. And they had to be thinking, how could it be better? He says, well, that way the helper is going to come and he's going to take residency within you. And that's why it's better. So the Lord God, the Holy Spirit can teach us much, especially here in John 10. And as we work through this text, I want I want us to think about what Jesus says of himself. Catch that this morning. What does Jesus say of himself? What does he say about the others that he will bring up? And then I want you to consider, this is personal, but who are you allowing to shepherd you the most? And even Christians can, can fall here and, and allow other shepherds to lead them that shouldn't be leading them. Sometimes I come across a new believer and they're excited and I don't want to put water on that fire by any means, but sometimes they're so excited and they don't have any real rooting yet and they just assume that if you're on television or if you've written a book and you claim to be a Christian, you must be good. And they'll say, Daryl, I got to tell you about this quote that such and such said. I'm like, oh goodness. Now, now here's the thing, even false prophets can have good quotes. But I try to help them see, you know, a little more clearly as to why this is probably not the person you want to listen to. Don't let them shepherd your heart. Because I'm jealous, right? No. Because when you're in the Word, and you hear other people use parts of the Word, but you also see that there's an agenda attached to how they're using it, as a shepherd, as an under-shepherd, you have to speak up and say, sheep, don't listen to that. I don't care how many people follow, how many people give to them, how many television stations they're on, how many continents they've preached on don't listen to them well the good shepherd discourse goes from john chapter 10 verse 1 through 18 and it comes after the healing of a blind man 
where Jesus not only healed him physically, but then a little bit later healed him spiritually. I do think that the Good Shepherd discourse is in connection with Jesus' words to some unbelieving Pharisees that we left off with in John chapter 9, verses 40 through 41. So in chapter 10, verse 7, when John writes, So Jesus again said to them, well, I think that's the continuance of Jesus addressing those phony religious leaders for the, the people of Israel. The people that he was addressing there in Jerusalem. I think it was in Jerusalem. But I'm going to do this in three ways, three points. Apparently that's the rule. Not really, but I am doing it this way. Verses 7 and 8 will be one point. Verses 9 and 10, the second point. And then verses 11 through 13, the final point. But here's your subtitle. Contrasts between Jesus and false shepherds. We're going to see contrasts. And it's good to know those. Especially when you're trying to, to decipher, is, is the shepherd leading me a good shepherd? Are they under the, the head of Christ? Or are they simply seeking to use me as a mean for their own gain? means for their own gains so verses 7 and 8 Jesus is the door others are thieves and robbers look at verse 7 of John 10 so Jesus again said to them truly truly I say to you I am the door of the sheep all who came before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep did not listen to them so now we have a shift in his analogy or his metaphor even he is calling himself the door. Door is thura. It means entrance way. But what's interesting is that in the original language, you have the definite article, the. He doesn't say I'm a door. No, I am the door. And when people say, I just don't like it being that exclusive. I want there to be many doors. And I could just hear some of my southern friends saying, well, darling, you can want all you want. But Jesus says he's it. And you better be glad that, that, that there is the door. Because he could have left you without one. And Jesus doesn't say, I'm one way of many, like so many uh, religious people of the day will tell you. Well, let's coexist. And I understand that we have to live in a world where there's pluralism. I get that. But when it comes to your soul, when it comes to my soul, there is only one hope for it. And Jesus says, I am that hope. The door. The only door. And there will be no other doors. He's emphatic in his, in his language there. In verse 8, all who came before me is referring, I think, to those present day religious leaders who were not faithfully shepherding the sheep or the Jews. Remember, back in chapter 9, Jesus healed a blind man. It was on a Sabbath day. I think in connection to the Feast of Booths, or at least shortly thereafter. And the Pharisees were not happy about it because this was done on a Sabbath day, and that's one of their rules. You can't heal somebody on a Sabbath day unless it's to save their life. And Jesus exposes them for the frauds that they are. And this man, instead of rejoicing over the fact that he had been born blind, had been blind every day of his life, and instead of saying he they're like, he broke one of our rules. Can you imagine not rejoicing over an undeniable miracle? Now, folks, I'm going to do the rabbit trail thing for just a few seconds, maybe more. Miracles are not normative. Well, it's just another everyday miracle. You'll hear that stuff. Oh, it was a miracle. I got the best parking spot in the lot. Now, I know people are, you know, just using language. But folks, miracles are rare. They're very rare. And we don't reduce them to being just something that we consider miraculous. Did you see that play? It was miraculous. What, did an angel come down and take the ball? No. He just he threw the pass and the guy caught it. Yeah, that's, that's what happens. That's what happens. But Jesus had performed a verifiable miracle and the religious but lost Pharisees were angry about it because he did it outside of their man-made parameters. And Jesus says to them, all who have come before me, speaking to them, I think, you're not shepherds. Not only did you not rejoice over the healing of this man physically and also the salvation of his soul, but you've kicked him out of the synagogue. 
You have sought to ruin him because he would not comply. He would not submit to your godless authority. These are religious imposters, frauds and phonies, robbers and thieves. Thieves and robbers never come for your good. If your house or car ever gets broken into, typically a robber doesn't leave a note saying, hey, you only had $10, I left $100 for you. No, they take what they can and leave you with less. They take what they didn't work for, but what you did work for or what you were given. And then Jesus speaks of sheep. I am the door of the sheep. Again, the definite article. Referring here to the true sheep who belong to God. Not just sheep in general, but the elect sheep. Those who will be born again. I am the door for these. And someone might push back and say, wait a second. Is he not the, the door for, for all sheep? Well, the fact is, he is the only way of salvation. But not all will find it. Not all will be rescued. And Jesus is saying, I am the door and I have the sheep whom I will save. That's going to happen. Back in John chapter 10 verses 3 through 5, Jesus in that earlier analogy talked about sheep hearing his voice. He calls his own name, leads them out. But strangers they will not follow. They will flee from. Jesus is saying, I am the door for my sheep. My sheep will be saved. They will follow. That's going to happen. This is not Jesus strolling into town saying, oh, I hope people will like me. I just hope that people will, will fall in love with me and choose me. I'm just waiting and, waiting and wondering. No, I am the door. I have sheep. I will save. They will come. This is a powerful passage, folks. And if you think that I'm, you know, I'm tainting it or making it mean-spirited, I just want you to picture Jesus in this arena talking to enemies. The good shepherd, I think of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. There are enemies all around him, and he's not backing down, and he's not mamby-pamby. He's telling them, you're false shepherds. I'm the sheep, or I, I'm the door. Uh, I am the way for these sheep, and you can't stop me. I will save. Amen. This is powerful, folks. So Jesus, I think, was dealing with the present reality of religious Jews being religious phonies who not only did they not seek for the good of God, for the good of God's sheep, but they actually sought for the harm of God's sheep. But they wouldn't do that. Oh, they would and they do. But, but religious people aren't like that. Their motives are pure. Have you read the Bible? When Paul has to deal with the issue and Peter has to deal with the issue and they talk about people, how they disguise themselves for, with the purpose of coming in and destroying and scattering the sheep. We cannot afford to be naive here, folks. We have religious phonies among us as well. They pride sheep. They seek to use the sheep for their own sinful gain. I want to remind you of the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 as well as Matthew chapter 24 when he said they're coming. They're, they're ravenous. They, they are seeking to, to kill you. And then Paul in 2 Corinthians 11 as well as Galatians 2 talking about false shepherds. They might look like the real deal, but just keep watching their fruit. They're going to be, uh, they're going to be exposed. They're not in this for your good. They're seeking can gain and they're good at how they come across and they're good at being persuasive and they're good at looking like the real deal but I'm telling you they're not the real deal and they're going to kill you that's what their aim is but thankfully we have a good shepherd who has come in and put under shepherds in place to warn you about them and then second Peter chapter 2 which is very similar to Jude again we hear more about false shepherds yeah. false apostles phonies who look like the real deal. They wear the right garb, but they're not. Yes. They're not those who belong to God. Folks, I know that's a painful reality. I get it. Mm -hmm. But even in a secular sense, people understand, I'll use a different analogy. If someone called you up, or let's say you were looking at your email, you got an email. I, I guess I'm probably the only person this has ever happened to, but there is some prince in Africa and I forget how many millions of dollars he, he has for me. Um, I haven't, I, I know I should tap into that, but I haven't yet. I've got to give him some information, my, I think my social security, I think I've even got to get him a credit card number. And I'm thinking about it, you know, because I'm like, man, millions. 
No, wait, am, am I not the only one who's received that email? Wow. Well, okay. I thought I was special. And you're saying, Daryl, quit being silly. Folks, sometimes imposters are so goofy, you're like, leave me alone. But then other times people come in and you're like, man, what a presentation. I mean, we, here's evidence. We still have pyramid schemes. Oh, it's not a pyramid scheme, really. I mean, mostly, sort of not, uh, a little. But people still buy in. We still have some naivety. I think I got that word right. We've got to be on guard. That doesn't mean suspicious to where we can never smile or enjoy a conversation with people. But we have to understand, especially in the context of our, of our spiritual being, of, of our souls, we have targets. If we're in Christ, we, we have targets on us. And there are wolves who seek to harm. Yeah. We've got to know that. Well, look at verses 9 and 10. Whereas Jesus says that I am the door, others are thieves and robbers. Well, in verses 9 and 10, we're going to see that Jesus saves, others seek to destroy. Yeah? It's a little repetitious. That's okay. Verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. There again, the definite article. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Wow, what a verse. You ought to be driving a brand new Bentley, have a 10,000 square foot home here and in uh, some far off place. And you ought to be wearing gold that shines and diamond rings that, that do their things. And, or does it mean that? No. Repetition and reward. Verse 9, Jesus repeats, I am the door. The door, the thura, the entranceway, the only one. It's so emphatic, so exclusive. And then he says, if anyone enters by me. We've come across this word if before. There's multiple um, Greek words for the, the, the preposition or the, the little part of, part of, the little word if. Learning English as I go, folks. It's conditional in saying, here's the statement, and if this, if this follows, then this shows that it to be true. If anyone enters by me, that's the only condition. That's the only access. He will be saved. So what's the opposite? If you do not enter by me, guess what? You're not saved. But I am a religious person. I'm, or, or in modern language, I'm a very spiritual person. I'm very in tune. You know, I watch the people on Oprah and I, I resonate with them. And they, they do these weird breathing exercises where they open their eyes real big. And man, I, I'm like, I feel that. I'm spiritual. You come by Jesus or you don't come at all. Oh, that's, not very, that's not very enlightened. That, that, that's, that's very, very exclusive. And that's not very tolerant. Jesus said it. Well, what about these people who are ultra-religious? They will outperform you left and right. I won't deny that people might out, uh, they might outperform me. But see, the performance that God accepts is not mine or theirs. It is the perfect performance of His Son and no one else. I am the door. I'm the only door. You enter by me and only me, you will be saved. If you try any other way, you will find no salvation there. But we just had a vote of seven to two by the Pharisees that we're in good standing, yet their vote doesn't count. Well, I've been at church more than any of my friends. That doesn't do you any good. Well, I pray 25 times a day. Tell me about it. Well, I pray to God. I pray to Buddha. I, no. Jesus says, I'm the door. And if you come by me, you will be saved. But you cannot come any other way and be saved. The sinner coming to faith in Jesus is doing this. They are acknowledging something. Jesus, I have no other hope. 
I have no righteousness of my own worth anything. I have no religious background to give to you. I have no uh, re uh, resume or list of references good enough. I am completely undone, dead in my sin, helpless and hopeless, and I'm at your mercy, God. I'm not looking to anyone else. I'm not crying out to any other Savior. I'm crying out to you to rescue me. And Jesus says, you're saved. You're saved. And the person who says, well, Lord, I want a little bit of you and a little bit of this religion and a little bit of that philosopher. No. I'm it. I'm absolutely it. Salvation is a reward, but so also is the life that follows the saved sheep will be led by the shepherd into the sheepfold. That's where we find safety. He'll lead them out of the sheepfold. We, he doesn't just lead us into safety and just say, stay here. <laughs> no, he leads us out to pasture. Let's go. Well, Lord, there are dangers out there. I'm the good shepherd. I'm going before you. Lord, there are wolves. There's many scary things. There's darkness. There are other predators. I'm the good shepherd and I've got you. But, but will you be enough? I am enough. But what if it's a bear? I can take care of that. What if it's a lion? I can take care of that too. Remember back in the Old Testament when David went before King Saul and, and was asking for permission to fight against Goliath. And Saul said, boy, this guy's been a warrior from his youth and you're just a youth. And what did David do? He said, on two occasions, he remembered God's faithfulness in past times. He said, on two different occasions, while shepherding my father's sheep, a lion and a bear came. I went after both of them, killed them both. And this giant will be just like them. Jesus, are you sure that you can lead me beside still waters? Are you sure that you can protect me from the ravenous wolves? Are you sure? Table with all of the enemies around and I'll be in security in you? I'm absolutely sure. I'm the good shepherd. <laughs> and by the way, all I have to do is roar a little and those little lions and those little bears, they just flee. I'm the good shepherd. What a moment, right? By contrast, anyone who tries to gain salvation any other way will not find salvation. They will remain in their sins. Jesus talked about that in a different gospel account talking about the broad road to destruction. Many find it, but the narrow gate few find. He is the narrow gate. So how do people seek to gain access to God by other ways? Well, their own keeping of the law or their, they think they're keeping the law. I've got news for you folks. Our problem is not that we don't keep the law. Our problem is, is we were condemned by it from the start. In the womb. If, imagine, and this is a very light, pitiful example, but imagine running a marathon on purpose. I can't get it, but some people do. And you run, and you actually come across the finish line first, and you're waiting to receive cheers, applause, and notoriety, and then an official comes to you and says, I'm sorry, we had no record of you entering this. Look at me. <laughs> the cameras were on me. I'm sweating. I ran. You weren't in the race. You were never in. What? But I beat everyone else. You were disqualified from the start because you were never in. Folks, we are not law keepers. Not because we showed up and just didn't do well enough. We were law breakers from the start. So our own self-righteousness will not be approved by God. Our being religious will not be approved by God. The only thing that a person will have that God accepts is when they say, your son rescued my pitiful soul. He's, he's my, my only claim, my only boast. I have nothing else, no one else. He's it. Are you sure that Jesus is it? He's it. Okay. You're rescued. But let's look at a couple of different motives still in verses 9 and 10. In verse 10, Jesus speaks again of the thief or the false shepherd whose intent and desire is to take for himself at the cost of others. But they also seek for the destruction of the sheep. To a false shepherd, a sheep is merely a means of personal gain. I'll take their wool, I'll take their meat, I'll take the money I can get for them. I don't care about them. I care about my best life now. 
Yes, I did that intentionally. Uh, wasn't even in my notes. I know that there's a popular book, it shouldn't be, but there's a popular book called Your Best Life Now. I will simply quote from Dr. John MacArthur, who when I heard it, I went, that's why I love this man. Dr. John MacArthur said, if your best life is now, you're going to hell when you die. I was like, MacArthur said that, I'm with him. Even if MacArthur didn't say it. But that's what false shepherds do. They live for their best life now. Because now is the best that it will get for them. Jesus, in contrast to the thief, came into the world so that, and that's that little word hena, it denotes purpose, so that his sheep would have life and have it abundantly. Parasos, it, it's full. He came to save sheep, his sheep, and give them this full, abundant life, which is actually eternal life. Jesus is claiming to be the salvation and the security for his people. You need to pray for me because I still struggle with security. And I don't mean thinking that I'm saved and lost, but I'm talking about in the day-to-day -day living, in the day-to-day -day pastoring, God is grace fellowship going to make it. And if you're going, Daryl, how could you think such a thought? I mean, we're, we're 11 months in. I know, crazy. That I, that I couldn't imagine us being you know, here for years and years. I, I hope so. But I have a mind, and I'm weak. And I look, at, I look at tangibles. I look at circumstances. I'm guessing I'm not the only one who does that, but I really struggle with it. Rather than saying, Christ, you are my security. This is your church. <laughs> you know what you're doing. I woke up today, and I didn't say, Lord, is the earth still on the right axis, or am I going to freeze to death or burn up? God, is there going to be enough, enough oxygen to breathe? He didn't say, oh, dear, I'm glad you woke up and reminded me. Son, I'm your security. I'm your salvation. And I'm your security. He really is. But I want us to think for a moment about this interaction between Jesus and these religious phonies. We who are the people of God, those who have been saved by Jesus Christ, we need to emulate Jesus when sharing the gospel. Jesus didn't mince words. He was direct and truthful. He said that he is the only way. So we must preach what he preached. Otherwise, we're not really his people. Well, I, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe the Bible. Really? And what does that even mean? Well, I'm a Christian, but I don't know that Jesus was sinless. What, what are you talking about? Well, I'm a Christian. In what sense? Well, got to identify something. Christians are the people who have been brought to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And the proof is they follow him. By, by his power, they follow. We must preach what Jesus preached. One of the things that I've seen in, in recent years, especially in young people who go to college, and you, you know I'm not against college. I went to college, graduated, did all that. But one of the things I'm, I'm finding more and more, young people, they go to church where they hear preaching that's not really doctrinally deep, and they don't step into a college classroom with a, an atheist uh, professor, and in a matter of days that, well, I don't even know if the Bible's true. Well, I'm believe the Old Testament. Well, Jesus believed it. Well, I'm a Christian, but I don't really think that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. Well, Jesus said he was. Well, I'm a Christian, but I don't think Jesus was telling the truth. What? Folks, if Jesus preached it, we must be willing to preach it too. And do not let unbelievers persuade you to speak less than what he spoke. We do not need to take the counsel of unbelievers, especially when it comes to sharing the gospel. Unbeliever, how would you like to be witnessed to? I just want to be your friend. I just want you to like me. Well, Daryl, this whole thing where you preach that Jesus is the only way, yeah, that, that's just a little too confining. Well, you know what? We'll take that off the table. What else? And this whole thing about Jesus having to, to die, I don't know, that's kind of gory. Let's just say he was a good example. You know what? Will you still like me if I agree? Yeah, then I agree. You know what I've done, folks? I have failed. I have surrendered to an unbeliever rather than to the living Christ. 
We cannot, we cannot, we must not preach less than what Jesus preached. And we must not be caught up in the idea of, well, people won't listen to us or people won't like us. I want to tell you something. One of the best things about Reformed theology is this. We are absolutely certain that God is going to save his people. We know it. God doesn't send us out and, and well, maybe they will, Daryl. I sure hope they'll get saved. God says, I know mine and I'm going to rescue you. You preach the word, I'll do the saving. And we can rest in him. It's not technique. It's not mechanisms. It's God who saves, and we can rejoice in that, folks. And no matter how bad times get, no matter how gloomy the spiritual front is, God is a saving God, and He's going to save every last one of His people. He's going to do it. He will do it. Third and finally, in verses 11 through 13, Jesus gives His life. Others seek to preserve their lives. There's really... No comparison here. In verse 11, follow along with me. Jesus says, I am, that's ego I mean, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life, and I want you to catch this word, for. For the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. So in verse 11, Jesus shifts from calling himself the door to now calling himself the good shepherd. He is both the door and the good shepherd. But in this discourse, we have to see him as using this analogy to speak of himself in contrast to the lost Pharisees who were surrounding him. He speaks of what he will do in but a few months, which is that he will lay down his life for the sheep. For there's the word hupar. And, and there, this is significant. See, I could die for you. I could, if, if the government came in and said, somebody's got to die today or we're going to kill all of these people, I could say, sir, I'm the senior pastor. I will give my life. I'm willing to do that. So I'm going to give my life for them. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. I can give my life that would spare you and give you a little more time. But me giving my life doesn't do you one thing for your soul. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. Shepherds face danger. And sometimes they actually give their lives to protect the sheep, but in a far greater way. I'm laying down my life for the sheep. Those are the sheep, God, the, the believing sheep. And I'm giving my life for them. You see, my father is going to see that as a willful sacrifice. An acceptable sacrifice but but here's the deal because sheep are sinners we're and sheep here being people because people are sinners well sin has to be dealt with and we we don't just make it disappear sin doesn't just go poof it's gone sin has a payment and that payment has to be absorbed by someone see if I come in and you have a debt if I'm a president and I just say, look, I'm going to remove this debt, you say, wow, you absorbed that debt. No, I just pretended like I did. Trust me, it's right back on you. What Jesus does is he says, you owe a debt, a debt so great you could never even come close to paying it. And that debt has to be paid. God will not just dismiss it. He's righteous and holy. He won't. He won't just say, well, like it was never there. <laughs> No, somebody's got to pay for it. And here's the, here's the real dilemma. No sinner can do that. So there has to be one who is sinless. And I'm that one. And that sinless one has to be willing. I'm willing. And I'm going to go and I'm going to lay down my life for you, my sheep. And my sacrifice is going to be a bloody one. And I'm going to die. And the aroma is going to reach the nostrils of my father and he's going to be well pleased with it. And that debt that you had against him, I'm paying that for you. I'm carrying that. I'm not just like writing on a piece of paper and tearing it up. No, I'm paying for it. See, wrath has to be rightly apportioned, so it's going to be aimed at me, not you. So in the atonement, folks, 
Jesus actually says, Father, aim your wrath at me. And he does. And the son takes it and he bears it, he absorbs it. What is Jesus really getting at here? Sheep, you need a substitute. Because you can't do it. Think about the Old Testament system. How many sheep and lambs were, were killed? God's old system required it. I mean, thousands, if not millions. But none of them could do for sinners what Jesus alone can do for them. By the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, full atonement is made for his people. Full atonement, can it be? <laughs> Hallelujah, what a savior. God in heaven now looks at me, a rescued sheep, and says, righteous. <laughs> and before I say, that's right, I, I say, thanks be to your son Jesus, because he's my righteousness. <laughs> he's my hope, Father. He's all I've got. And I know that some people have a hard time with substitutionary atonement. They, they, I think the false teacher Robert Shuler, who's now deceased, I think he called it cosmic child abuse. Well, the Bible makes it clear there's a substitute that has to be in place. And Jesus is that substitute. And Jesus did make atonement and no one else can or did. Right. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God, who is the good shepherd, who is the door, who is the Savior. In verses 12 and 13, Jesus refers to a hired hand. And I think this is different in comparison to the false shepherds. In this particular part of the analogy, the hired hand is hired out by shepherds to watch the sheepfold while they are not able to. Whereas false shepherds have evil motives, hired hands are just kind of hired people who are like, yeah, I'll do a job. I do the job. You pay me when I've done the job, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, now, are you fully vested in this enterprise? No, I just needed to work. Job was open. You're offering this much money to do this job. I'm willing to do it. Okay, sounds good. Except hired hands sometimes recognized the wolves coming and realized this job is not for me. That wolf is going to get through me to get to the sheep. Well, I'm not sticking around for that. That's not the job I signed up for. I'm not giving them a pass, but it is a little different from the false shepherd who knows what they're doing. I'm only using the sheep for my gain. The hired hand says, hey, I'm in this for my own good, yes, and, and I'll watch your sheep so long as everything's fine, but the second an enemy shows up, I'm out of here. That's a hired hand. They have no investment. They do not care for the sheep. Folks, there are pastors who run when it gets tough. And I, I cannot tell you in truth that I've never thought about running. I remember in my early days of pastoring there at South Whipple and they were good to me. And you have those, those months there when things are fine and then there's times when things arise and things get tough. And, and even if I didn't have anything to do with it, you're the, you're the leader and buddy, you're the one having to have the meetings and, and get yelled at and, and having people turn you like uh, when you see them at a restaurant, they turn away even though you didn't do anything to them. And that, that it makes it heavy on your soul. But true under shepherds say, Lord, you didn't, you didn't call me to this just so I could do a job and get a paycheck. You, you saved me and you put me in this to lead your sheep and I'm, I'm not the best at it, but Lord, I'm going to stay even when wolves come. Or even when there's conflict, not even amongst the wolves, but amongst the sheep, that happens too. But Lord, I'm not going to run by your power and your grace. I'm going to stick around because your sheep do matter to me. I'm one of them, but, but Lord, they're yours and that, that means something to me. Folks, I, I'll tell you this in truth. There are times when I'm in this building alone and, and I, uh, I, I come out and I pray and I, one of the prayers I've prayed here, I'm like, Lord, these are not my sheep, they're yours. They're yours. Lord, help me to do this job well because I know my inadequacies are many, but Lord, you've called me to this, so help me to shepherd well. And I'm, I'm convinced that Greg's the same way. Lord, we just want to shepherd your people well. Hired hands say, I'm in this as long as there's a paycheck involved. But the true under shepherd says, I'm here no matter what because Christ has saved me. 
The wolves in the analogy refer not necessarily only to the enemy of the sheep, but even the false shepherds them, themselves. Back in Matthew 7, 15, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about them coming. The Apostle Paul, in his final words to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, he talked about shepherding the flock of God, which God purchased with his own blood. And he said, look, wolves are coming. You've got to be ready. You've got to stick it out. We've got to remember that Jesus gave his life for his sheep. And we the sheep must be willing to stand and trust in him no matter what. Thank Jesus for taking your place efficient substitutionary sacrifice. Seek to be led by under shepherds who marvel in Christ and look out for the good of his sheep. Resist the influence of false shepherds and hired hands who will prove to only be looking out for themselves. And as I close, I say this to my family in Christ. Fellow believers, we have been rescued by the good shepherd. And his name is Jesus. He is the Christ of God. He didn't just give his life. He gave his life for us. He went in our place. And we owe him everything. We have the good shepherd. Not just a good shepherd. The good shepherd. Who is the way and the truth and the life. And he gives life now and forevermore. And even if it doesn't feel like abundant life, Jesus says it is, and that's got to be enough. Do not let a materialistic society persuade you to think that the abundant life is this. You just trust that Jesus knows what it is, and he gives it. Yes. Give thanks to him, the good shepherd. And I want to do this to my family in Christ, especially those who are members. Not to say that if you're not a member, you can't do this. But pray for myself and pray for Greg as your under shepherds and pray for other congregations and their under shepherds whom the Lord has saved and has put into service. We know that we're not adequate. We know that. We need God's wisdom. We need His grace. We need His boldness. But we also need to remember that God, we cannot afford to buckle under pressure and run, but rather to stand firm in you and to shepherd your sheep. <coughs> Some days I, I feel stronger in that. Some days I feel weaker. But I'm always under this tension. Lord, I never know. It's easy to preach that I'll stand, but God, what if someone put a gun to my head? Oh, that I will be strong in Christ. Amen. You pray that for your shepherds if you would. Unbeliever, I'm not very original, and I used a question at the end of last week's sermon, and I'm using it again today. Who is shepherding you? Somebody is. Well, it's not Jesus. I know that because you're not a believer. So no matter how much affinity and affection you have for them, they're not good shepherds. They're not. Because there's only one good shepherd. And that is Jesus, God the Son. He gave his life for his sheep. Your shepherds won't do that. You say, okay then, preacher, what? What then? If I'm being led by this shepherd or that shepherd or those shepherds and none of them are good, then, then, then what resolve do I have? Oh, that God will open your eyes and that you will see. That your heart will be heavy because you've sinned against him and you'll be utterly ruined in that. And you're thinking, that's not the advice I wanted. Ah, but it's the advice you need. And, but there's more that you will see your complete inability to have right standing with God. And no sooner than the law tells you that, the law does something else. And I know I dipped into Galatians 3 there. But the law says, hey, broken and ruined sinner, you can't keep me. I know, but don't worry, there is one who did. <laughs> and the law points us to Jesus, the law giver and the law keeper. And you say, Jesus, that Nazarene carpenter, he's all you've got and he's all you need. Will you look to him? Will you, will you admit to him that, God, I'm a sinner against you? God, I can't undo this. I can't do anything to make this better. And I'm looking to you whom I've sinned against. And I'm asking you for mercy and grace and forgiveness, Lord. You know what the good shepherd will do? He will pardon you. He will make you his own. <laughs> Not because of any sincerity or prayer that you've prayed, but because you have believed in Christ unto salvation. That's really good news. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved 
and we'll go in and out and find pasture. Those are not mere words. That's a promise from Jesus himself. Before we partake in the Lord's Supper, would you bow with me as I close this in prayer? Father in heaven, thank you so much for your son. Lord, we were utterly ruined, dead in our sins, not weak, not comatose, but dead, completely unable to do anything for our souls. Not only is Jesus Christ given his life for his sheep, but he's also given regeneration. He has, he has given us eyes to see. He's actually breathed life in. And, and now, Lord, we can repent and believe. And even those are not works of our own, but they're gifts from you. I pray that the true sheep today are going to be encouraged to keep looking to the good shepherd. <laughs> oh, God, do that for us. And I pray that the lost sheep will hear the words of Jesus and realize there is no other way. And today, they too will look to the good shepherd, repent and believe for your glory and even our good, I pray. Amen.